On the phone, it is my pleasure to welcome to the program a um, man who cooks a, uh, a great shank of beef. He is the uh, contributing editor to uh, Rolling Stone magazine, Guy Lawson, here to talk about his awesome piece in uh, Rolling Stone magazine. The I believe it's the uh, March 31st um, uh, Rolling Stone magazine, The Stoner Arm Dealers. How two American kids became big time weapons traders. Welcome to the program, Guy. Hey, Sam. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, this is this story. Uh, you know, I remember when it broke in the Times back in the day. It sort of disappeared, and uh, this this is the one of the funnest, sort of most disturbing <laughs> stories I've read in a long time. It's about these two guys, David Pakuas. Packhouse. Packhouse and Ephraim De Veroli. Um, tell us the story of these two guys and, and, and what it has to do with um, uh, the, uh, our, the, the new normal in America, as far as I can tell. These, these are two kids um, who live down in South Beach. They're both uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish kids that went to the same yeshiva. And they were just really smart kids who had a uh, had developed an extensive taste for um, marijuana and money, I suppose you'd say. Now, um, when we say kids, we're not talking like uh, you're, we're a couple of old fuddies and these guys are, you know, 30. These guys were in their teens. Yeah, one of, these, one of the kids is Ephraim Divaroli. Uh, his father and his uncle uh, were involved in what you could call the arms trade. Um, his father just sold sort of Kevlar vests and things. But his uncle was a real gun dealer to police, to law enforcement, and, and Diveroli apprenticed to him after he got kicked out of high school. And so he spent about a year or two working for his uncle, and he, the, the kid is just a genius. The kid had a native touch for it. You might think of it like computer hackers, just a, somebody who has a passion for it and a, an instinct and, and an ability. So he, uh, he set up on his own, like he rented a room from this Latino family in South Beach when he was 16 or 17. I guess you know, by then he was 18. He started up his own company called AEY, and uh, he began to bid on federal arms contracts. Uh, it's, it, federal law requires that all contracts be placed online at a place, a website called Fed Biz Ops. If any of your listeners want to start dealing arms, it's just that simple. You can go on and start, you know, bidding on contracts. I mean, there's obviously things that you need to do to qualify, and the world of arms, you know, bidding for Pentagon contracts is pretty arcane, and there's lots of forms. The, this Diveroli kid was just excellent at it. And so he began to bid on small kind of obscure, hard-to-do contracts that the big companies wouldn't be interested in, like, you know, supplying a couple of hundred um, AKs from the Soviet, era, Soviet Union to train special forces in Germany. Things that, you know, that the huge, you know, all-consuming Fortune 500 companies wouldn't bother to bid on or wouldn't really, you know, know how to bid on it as, as nimbly as he could because he had no overhead, no staff, no anything. And so he started to win these little contracts. He was sort of like the majority report of arms dealers in a way. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and aiming to be, you know, Rush Limbaugh. There you go. There you go. And uh, so he builds a essentially a track record and a credibility for himself by doing these uh, small-scale jobs. And yeah, you call it past performance. And he, pretty soon, within a year, the kid's a millionaire. Wow. And he, said, and he says to his buddy, Packhouse, who's like the smartest kid in their group, and this is, you know, this is a group of smart kids. These, you, know, every, you know, there's a way in which the Times portrayed this. The New York Times story, if anybody remembers it, it's like that the David Packhouse was a masseuse and the Diveroli was a lunatic. There's, you know, there's a lots of ways in which this story uh, uh, doesn't match up with the facts, so this, this story is much more complicated. They're really bright kids. And so he says to Packhouse, you want to you know, you come in with me? And Packhouse says, uh, dude, how much money have you made out of it? And Diveroli, you know, fesses up and says, I've got two million bucks in the bank. And, you know, Packhouse is, a, is an aspiring musician, uh, but he's like doing massages out of Craigslist. He, you know, he, he's not sure what to do with himself. He's going to college part time, so he joins up with Diveroli, and they start to, uh, you know, as a co four commission kind of collaborator, and they start to bid on these uh, these various contracts. And Diveroli continues to succeed. Packhouse is struggling as an apprentice, but then, you know, in 2006, seven, the Bush administration, and uh, this will 
I no doubt give your listeners such pleasure to recall these days. Yes. The Bush administration uh, realized that, that Afghan, its Afghanistan policy was going to hell in a handcart. And so, and the concern that was later conveyed to, to these kids is that the Pentagon and, and the powers that be were worried that a Democrat, if elected, might um, withdraw from Afghanistan, should we that, be so lucky, right? That, that's the most hilarious aspect of the story, almost. Yeah, so they, they decided to basically dump as much ammunition as they could possibly buy into Afghanistan in order to uh, 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 make sure that their you know, comrades in arms weren't, weren't abandoned in the field. You know, needless to say, the blowback from that will last a generation or two. Right. Um, so, they, so they put out this, this thing, this, this solicitation, it's called, for... 100 million rounds of AK, 25,000 million drillion RPGs, just every, you know, lit literally scour up the entire Eastern Europe, put it on an airplane, and dump it into Afghanistan. Oh. And so, and so this, this contract is a one uh, winner take all. One bidder, one contract. And so, you know, without a, without a number attached to it, so all these massive companies go out and bid. So you have, you know, 20 companies chasing this, and one of them is AEY. And so this is just David and Ephraim literally in the living room with a volcano, you know, the, the pot vaporizer? I've heard of it. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of a stack of high-quality high weed, you know, working, the, working around the clock, calling up, uh, sorry, it's just some kids playing, uh, calling up every arms-dealing uh, nefarious Eastern European company and getting quotes, getting prices. So, you know, they basically throw in a bid. Diveroli, is, it's his money, so he's sort of in charge. He, he doesn't know what to bid. He's like, do I bid 10% margin, 5% margin, 12%? He's trying to guess what, the, uh, you know, what, what price will get him there. He bid $299 million and like $99.99 kind of thing. And it, we don't know to this day how much he actually beat the next bidder by, but, but it was on the order of $100 million. Wow. So he underbid his competitors by $100 million in bidding uh, basically $300 million to deliver all of the, um, the loose uh, ammunitions that are floating around Eastern Europe. As much as they can get there. <laughs> now, this, that, now, now, basically, America's foreign policy in Afghanistan, which you could argue, as, as then-candidate Obama was, was the single most important foreign policy objective, was in the hand of two stoners, one a high school dropout and one a masseuse. Oh, my God. And uh, so they, they proceeded to try to fulfill this contract. And what the story um, uh, uh, portrays, and the larger project that I'm working on, which will be a follow-up uh, um, book, is that, um, is that you know, the kids become the portal into the world of arms trading, arms dealing, and, and, and the, the nexus of politics and violence. And uh, really, you know, the technicolor version of the Bush administration, like literally everything that was awful about it, all under one roof, you know, so, in, including the naivety, the adolescent attitude, the, uh, uh, the double dealing, the mealy mouthing and the amorality. I mean, it's really it's an incredible story. And um, the magazine article really only touches, you know, gives you. I guess, you know, sort of a, an introduction to, a cliff's note to, and, and, and uh, as, as Sam and I, as we discussed the other day, there's lots of stuff that, that is yet to emerge that I'm reporting on that'll, I think, point in some very interesting directions. But the essence of it is that the kids um, imagine themselves to be kind of, you know, latter-day Victor Boots or, you know, Khashoggi's. Right. They're, now, they, these know, guys, they ended up like... I mean, the, the, the story, uh, people have to read this because I, it, 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 it cannot be done justice. The idea <laughs> of these guys on the phone freaking out with some guy in... I'll jump to that real quick. But basically what they do is they fall in with this Swiss guy named Enric Tomé, who's, you know, who is the real world. He's the actual arms dealer in all this. You know? He's their conduit to the big-time deals. And, and one of them is in Albania. In Albania, if anybody's been there as I have, you know that it's basically one big arms cache. You know, it was the most paranoid government on earth for decades. So these kids were emptying out Albania uh, under the watchful eye of the State Department and Pentagon, and, and it all goes really, really wrong w uh, when they begin 
when they discover that they're selling Chinese manufactured ammunition. Now, why is that a problem? Because after Tiananmen Square, the American government, in its infinite wisdom, put an embargo on all Chinese manufactured ammunition. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that this ammunition was given to Albania in the 1950s and 60s. So you can do the math. That predates Tiananmen Square by decades. So while it is, quote unquote, Chinese ammo, in what sense is it really Chinese ammo? You know, when does it become Albanian ammo? The kids, there's lots of ways the kids could have played it, literally a hundred ways to play it, and they chose the worst, which was to, uh, to try to, to lie and to hide it, to take off, to take the ammunition out of its Chinese marked boxes, sardine cans, put it into wooden, or sorry, cardboard boxes, and ship it all to Afghanistan. So that's, that's what happened. Um, it, it, it resulted in a local Albanian businessman getting in a dispute with the corrupt Albanian officials, which led to his demise, quote-unquote, accidental demise. And, uh, and that sort of, that also proceeded to, led to a tip to the New York Times, who then spent a year and eight different reporters on four different continents reporting the story, which resulted in a front-page story, which in turn resulted in the indictment of these three kids and one older gentleman who had been part of their financial, uh, who had been a financier for them. And, you know, what you basically have is the story as portrayed is of two really, I guess you'd call them idiotic, corrupt, greedy kids and two other people who were associated with them trying to victimize the American government and sell crappy ammunition to, uh, to the innocent Afghanistani army and police. So it's basically, uh, dude, story. where's that's my the armaments? Story. That, that, that's the story that, that the United States Attorney's Office wants you to believe. That's the story that the New York Times covered. It's actually completely and totally wrong. And, uh, and, and, I, and I hope, as we've discussed them, I can't really talk about it yet, but not to be cute, but um, it, it, it suffice to say that the American government was not fooled by this. They were getting what they wanted. And when it became public that what they wanted was crappy Albanian ammunition, and they didn't care if it was from China or Paraguay or anywhere. They just wanted the ammo. And when it became apparent that this was the Bush administration's policy, and this will probably be familiar to your listeners, someone had to carry the blame, and it wasn't going to be the Bush administration. So uh, there's obviously a lot more to this story. This is basically uh, chapter one. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's basically the introduction uh, yeah. to this story. It's the story that um, is... I, mean, there's a, I should say there's a lot of cocaine use, sex, swearing, and <laughs> fun along the way. I mean, if I'm making it sound dry, it's really not. I mean, the story... Which, if you want to read it, you Which can read again, it on my website. Which, again, is also very much why uh, we call this the, uh, it's like the majority report of, uh, of arms dealer stories. <laughs> right. Similar to your set. Similar to uh, your set. If you, if, I, mean, I don't know if I want to plug it any particular way. It doesn't do me any good. But if anybody wants to read it, it's at my website. Um, it's, it's at G-U-Y. L a w s o n dot com. Yeah, we will we will post a link to this. So now, uh, just give me a little bit of background. Like, how did you do your reporting on this? I mean, how did you uh, uh, did you uh, you you say you, you traveled to Albania? Where else did you where, where else did you travel? Who did you talk well, to? What, what what happened was, um, you know, I read this. I read the New York Times story as you did, and, and maybe a lot of your listeners did. It just was such an outrageous story, and uh, there was something about it that just didn't ring true. You know, it seemed a little pat that um, these two teenagers would somehow fool the whole world. Right. You know, I mean, you're, you're talking about... Because these guys to... actually sat down and they met with Defense Department. It wasn't just like it started Constantly. in their living room, but they, they actually had face-to-face -face contact. Constant contact. They, they, were, they were chartering hundreds of cargo planes. Tens and fifties and hundreds of millions of dollars was hitting their account. This ammunition was in wide use. It remains in wide use in Afghanistan. It's just, you know, the idea that, that everybody, you know, it's like, it's like the, 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 uh, the, the Humphrey Bogart movie. Where, um, you know, the, right. when it I'm comes shocked the to hear that there's gambling going on. I'm shocked to hear that there's dishonesty and conniving involved in the arms dealing business. Poor American government. So 
Uh, I was talking to my editor at Rolling Stone, and uh, I, we were talking about I've been repeatedly covering the Mexican drug wars, and that was getting a little old. So I said, what do you guys want me to do next? Like, what kind of story? And they said, I don't know, young kids doing fucked up things. So I went through the Rolodex of my head, and I thought, this is the best young kids doing. Can you swear on this, on the majority report? Sure, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I, you know, what I basically did, it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, secret of the trade, is, is that, you know, I used to be a lawyer. I know how the legal process works. And the moment you can approach people to talk to you is when they're right after they've been sentenced, right upon the time they're being sentenced, because all the jeopardy detaches from them. So... Basically, I, I, you know, I went down and, and, uh, to Miami Beach and talked to a uh, defense attorney and to one of the kids, and, um, and now I'm going to be in touch with the other of the kids. And so you know, I just, it was really a matter of having a good sense of timing or good luck and timing, and then uh, you know, also having the, um, you know, the, 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 the venue, as Rolling Stone does, you know, and, and I think a lot of your listeners will recognize this, to be critical and to be... Um, to tell to tell stories that, you know, if I was down there for the New York Times, I would not be able to tell the story the way right. it needs to get told. Well, listen, uh, and, and that's a real criticism I think of the press in this age. Absolutely, and how how complicit it is. All right, well, Guy, it's an amazing story, and we're looking forward to the book and the update. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. The website is guylawson.com. We'll have a link at majority.fm. Uh, to, uh, Can I just put in one little plug? Please. Yeah, you know, I just, I'm starting a, a for your listeners out there, I'm starting a, a draft Mark Green for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we'll certainly have you on to talk about that. Maybe we can have a debate. Go get him, Sam. All right, Gee, thank you so much for joining us. Talk to you us. later.